So this is the last of our series over the summer. We've been looking at some of our understanding, really, of why we gather. We looked at penal substitution. What does it mean that Christ died for us? How important it is we recognise that actually God was punishing our sin in him. We looked at what it means to have Christian assurance. To be certain, absolutely uh, absolutely 100% certain that we are going to be with Christ, that his Holy Spirit is his guarantee for us that we will be with him in that world to come. We looked at communion. What is it we're doing when we take communion? Last week we thought about church. Uh, why is we gather? How important, how essential it is whenever we can that we gather. And lastly we're looking at this uh, matter of <coughs> Sunday. What is so special, if anything, about Sunday? We will look at that passage from Hebrews um, in a little bit, but I want to uh, uh, begin by one or two other uh, comments and uh, suggestions. And it may well be that that uh, picture on the right is something that you might be familiar with when you were young. There's a, a young boy fishing and a couple of people looking very stern, frowning at him. And of course that is a picture of uh, the Sabbath, isn't it? A young chap, very much like me or maybe some of you as well, on Sundays wanted to go out and have rec recreation, yet somehow it's frowned upon uh, by our elders. Uh, that, of course, is uh, pretty long gone uh, now. <coughs> Queen Victoria uh, lived in that age when it was respected, of course. Uh, there's an anecdote told about her. One Sunday, she was out with her favourite uh, servant, a guy called John Brown. You probably know about him or have heard about him. Queen Victoria noticed someone fishing from a boat on the lock. Fancy people doing that on the Sabbath, she remarked. But ma'am, John Brown replied, the Lord Jesus was in a boat on the Sabbath. The Queen turned to him and replied sharply, two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I'll take issue with Queen Victoria on uh, one or maybe two or even maybe three of those matters. Uh, first of all, I think categorically she was wrong to suggest that Jesus Christ had made an error by going out on a boat with his uh, fishing uh, friends on the Sabbath. But secondly, I, I, I think, and there's a certain amount of my own understanding here of the scriptures, and uh, as always, we do say, if you here, don't take anything I say as being gospel. Consider it for yourself, weigh it up, look at the scriptures yourselves, and make your own decision. But uh, I think one of the errors that Queen Victoria also made was that she uh, assumes that the Sabbath rule in its Old Testament form still applied. And of course there were very strict rules about the Sabbath in the scripture, about uh, how it should be observed. Um, we can look at those perhaps uh, tonight and, and look at this uh, question in more detail. But thirdly, I also think personally that uh, Queen Victoria was wrong to assume that Sunday was necessarily the new Sabbath. That was her assumption, wasn't it? That she was out on a Sunday and she said, he is fishing on the Sabbath. That shouldn't happen. But actually the Sabbath was the seventh day. It's Saturday, of course, as you know. Uh, and we need to look at this matter of uh, why is it that many Christians uh, consider Sunday to be the new Sabbath? Well, the fourth commandment about keeping the Sabbath, I think, is the most difficult of all the Ten Commandments to interpret. If you turn in Exodus, don't turn it down, but if you were to turn in Exodus, chapter 20, uh, there are 15 verses that cover all Ten Commandments. Over a quarter of them are about the Sabbath itself, the Fourth Commandment. It takes up more space in the Ten Commandments than any of the other nine. And all the other nine are moral commands, very clearly, aren't they? We know what uh, murder is, we know what stealing is, we know what adultery is, we know that we can do it or we can't do it, we know there's a very clear line. Uh, although when Jesus Christ spoke about adultery and murder, the line became a little bit more blurred, didn't it? Not quite so uh, clear cut as we might have liked it to have been. But the other nine all appear to be very moral. Don't make any image of, of God. Don't blaspheme. Honour your father and mother. So how does the fourth commandment fit into that? Is it a moral commandment? And if it is, how do we obey it today? This is something that people have struggled with for centuries. Uh, in the 19th century, when you have uh, uh, wider travel coming in, the uh, working classes took their trains, the new, new trains around, and they could go to the beaches and have bank holidays. 
Sunday also became a day of relaxation and uh, entertainment and travel. And the Lord's Day Observance Society, which is still around today in the form of day one, uh, you might have uh, come across their publications, was uh, actually uh, um, founded in 1831, a year after, uh, or a couple of years after, the first trains began to take holidaymakers around the country. And of course, the Lord's Day Observance Society wanted to restrict Sunday travel, wanted to be a day uh, that was kept like the Sabbath. In America, some people were so concerned about desecration of the Sabbath that a new denomination was formed, the Seventh-day Adventists, who were certain that we had uh, upset God by disobeying the Sabbath law. And they, of course, even today, worship on Saturday. That is their day, the Seventh-day Adventists. They think we should go back and treat the uh, Fourth Commandment as uh, entirely applicable, uh, and indeed the other nine commandments in its original Old Testament form. Queen Victoria would have been happy, in some ways, uh, in their company. But what should we do? How can we observe this fourth commandment uh, today uh, and understand this, uh, this web, this tangled uh, web of different ideas about it? Well, let's, as with any of these commandments, let's have a think about how did Jesus understand it? We want to understand the Old Testament in any way at all, part of it, or the commandments in this case, or any part of the Old Testament. The New Testament is the key, always. It's such a big mistake many people make of interpreting the Old Testament by their own uh, ideas of it rather than going to what Jesus says and what the writers of the New Testament say about it. You might know the little ditty. The new is in the old concealed, but the old is in the new revealed. The New Testament reveals the understanding and meaning of the Old Testament. Let's start with Jesus Christ and what he said uh, about the Sabbath. The first thing to say is this, apart from his claim to be the Son of God, nothing made the Jews more angry than his interpretation of the Sabbath. Just uh, turn with me briefly to John chapter 5, uh, verses 16 to 18, which is page 1068, page 1068 of the, uh, of the church Bibles. Jesus has just performed a healing of uh, a man, at the, an invalid, at the pool of Bethesda. And in verse, uh, in verse 16, we read this. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working for this reason the Jews tried all the harder to kill him not only was he breaking the Sabbath but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God see those two things there yes they were uh, really upset and they wanted to kill him because he was calling himself the son of God, calling God his father, but almost in the same bracket, he is desecrating the Sabbath, they say. He's saying, my father, God himself is at work on the Sabbath. How could he say that when God has made the Sabbath such a holy day and God rested on the seventh day? And here he is saying God's working and he's working. You'd almost think actually, wouldn't you, that Jesus is provoking them at what he's saying. And by what he's uh, doing. We won't look at it now, but we've looked at Mark's Gospel over a, a, a long period, over last year, didn't we? And uh, you might remember in chapter 3 of Mark's Gospel, Jesus healed on the Sabbath day there. Um, he healed a man who had a shriveled hand. And it was at that point, it says, that the Pharisees and the Herodians went out and plotted to kill him. That was a straw for them that broke the camel's black. This man is healing on the Sabbath in front of everyone. And he doesn't seem to have any awareness of what this day is for. And so they decided the best thing that they could do was to, uh, was to kill him. Just before that, in Mark's Gospel, uh, Jesus has been walking through the cornfields with his disciples. The disciples had taken corn, plucked corn, rubbed it together and eaten it. They were hungry. It was, uh, uh, for them, a bit of nourishment. And he was challenged on that also. Why are the disciples uh, doing what is uh, illegal, what is not lawful on the Sabbath? 
although there's no law in the Bible about doing that, but they'd invented other laws about uh, what Sabbath work involved, and this is one of those things. At the end of that, Jesus comes up with this statement. He says, having spoken to them about uh, the Sabbath, he says, look, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, he says, is Lord even of the Sabbath. What does he mean by that? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Well, when God... Uh, when, when God instituted that seventh day, when he laboured six days in creation, the seventh day, we're told, uh, he blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The blessing of the seventh day was for us. It was for our benefit. It was a blessed day so that we could enjoy that day uh, with him. So that's what he means when he says the Sabbath was made for man. He created it as a day of rest, not just for himself, but for us to spend with him. That's why it is blessed, a blessed day. That's why it was made for us. He didn't uh, create some sort of holy uh, uh, diary and say, this day, everyone's going to keep it holy because I say so, and I'm boss. And it doesn't matter what you're doing or what you want to do, you should uh, actually uh, give up that and just do what I tell you to because uh, what I say goes. No, the Sabbath was made for us, for our benefit, for our blessing. And then secondly, he says this, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He was claiming lordship. He was claiming to be in control of it. He was claiming sovereignty over the Sabbath by saying that. If he was the one who designed it in the first place, we read elsewhere in the Bible that Jesus Christ was there at creation. He is the one who is the word of God, who is spoken, who goes out and actually creates so he actually was the one who brought this into being in the first place. And he's saying, actually, I have the absolute right, as the Lord of the Sabbath, to interpret it. And to show you its original purpose. To explain to you what it was for in the first place. And in fact, as with the rest of the law, uh, he says, he came not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. To give it its true meaning and its true purpose. Whenever we think about the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, we need to understand that he is Lord of it and he is the one who has the right to tell us how we should understand it. And in him, somehow, it will be fulfilled. He has not come to abolish the Fourth Commandment. He has come to fulfill it. Well, what does that mean, to fulfill uh, the, uh, the Fourth Commandment? Well, it seems to me that he is the one who inaugurates the Day of the Lord. That day that the Old Testament looked forward to, the day of the Lord, that becomes the day of Jesus Christ, my day, as Jesus said about Abraham, he looked forward to my day, this is what Jesus Christ is doing. He is fulfilling the Sabbath day. He is sometimes described in scripture as the morning star. The morning star. The morning star appears in the night sky just before dawn. You see? He is the one who has come as the herald of the dawn, the herald of of a new day. <coughs> in, uh, in Luke chapter 4, you might want to turn to this as well if you want to, but don't, uh, don't think you, you need to. But in Luke chapter 4, when he came to preach in Nazareth, in his hometown, it was again the Sabbath. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place, and it's a big book, Isaiah. He went all through it. He knew where it was, he wanted to go to. Where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendants, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What's that to do with Sabbath? Well, this scripture from Isaiah 61 is about the year of Jubilee. The year of the Lord's favour. <coughs> 
is the year of Jubilee. What's the year of Jubilee? Well, the year of Jubilee is the culmination of all the Sabbaths. In the Old Testament, every seven days, every six days, they would take one day off. But also, every six years, the land was to have a Sabbath after that as well. Six years, the land was to be worked, but the seventh year was a year of Sabbath, when the land also would have a rest. Then in Leviticus 25, they're told to count off seven Sabbaths. 49 years would have passed, and on the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, they were to have the mother of all Sabbaths. The Jubilee was when people were restored to the land. If you'd lost some land or if you'd uh, uh, been disinherited in some way, you received back your original inheritance. If you were a slave, you were given your freedom. It was a day uh, or a year uh, of, of release, of restoration, of return. If you like, it was a day when Israel had reset. The button was pressed on reset. Let's go back to how it was at the beginning. When Israel was first formed as a nation, and they all had an inheritance in the land, and everyone was treated equally. That is what Jesus is talking about here, the year of Jubilee. You see, it's the culmination of all the Sabbaths. And it's not so much about just having a physical rest. Jesus Christ is saying here, it's his manifesto to Israel, he's saying, I have come to introduce this mother of all Sabbaths. I've come to introduce the year of Jubilee. Not just rest, but restoration. Release from sickness and sin. All those things that are spoken about there. To preach good news to the poor. Freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. See, the day of the Lord has arrived. It is the year of the Lord's favour. The year of Jubilee. And Christ is saying, I am the one. It's my day. I have come to introduce this to you. And it's through a message you see that? I've come to uh, preach good news. It's good news that he's preaching. And that is the entry into this Sabbath, if we believe the message that Jesus has given us. So that is how Jesus, I, I believe, understood the Sabbath. Today, he says, today, this day, the day of my coming, the day of my gospel preaching, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So what about the rest of the New Testament? What do we uh, read there about Sabbath? Does this in fact corroborate what Jesus said? Well, after the Gospels, the observance of Sabbath disappears from view in the New Testament. Nowhere is it commanded in the New Testament. The word does occur when Paul is looking for a congregation to preach to. And he goes on his missionary journeys, and on the Sabbath he goes into the synagogues, because that's where the Jews were. And he preached to them uh, the good news of the gospel. It's also mentioned on the other occasion uh, when Paul warns Christians not to fall into the trap again of observing Sabbath days. He says it's a real danger you fall back into observance of the law, and think that somehow by observing the law you're going to be saved. So there's also a warning about Sabbath observance. But nowhere, actually, is it commanded. But what does happen in the New Testament, as with Jesus, is that what the fourth commandment, what the Sabbath day pointed towards, now takes centre stage. Actually, it doesn't disappear at all. Well, the Old Testament disappears, as Hebrews said, it's now obsolete. But what takes its place is actually, even like, the real Sabbath. Let's turn now to Hebrews 3 and 4. Because Hebrews 3 and 4, I think, gives us the, uh, uh, the principal understanding the New Testament. This is a, the, the old in the new revealed. And here is the writer of the Hebrews saying, this is what the Sabbath is all about. There remains, chapter 4, verse 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You see, it hasn't gone away. It's been fulfilled, but in ways perhaps that no one in the past would have understood, would be prepared for, until it is revealed by Christ and by the New Testament. The day of the Lord has arrived, and it is called today. Do you notice in that passage that uh, Jean Mary uh, read to us, several times, in fact, uh, four or five times, you have that word today. Verse 7, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice. Uh, verse 15, today, if you hear his voice. Uh, verse uh, uh, 
chapter 4 and, and verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, it occurs elsewhere in that passage as well. Today is the day of Jesus Christ. You'll see that in chapter 4 and verse 4 there, the writer links it to creation. In the same way that the Old Testament's fourth Sabbath, uh, fourth commandment linked the Sabbath to creation. So also here he said, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these, in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. So the writer there is saying, you need to link the, that uh, ordinance from creation uh, with today. And recognise that it's being fulfilled in what has happened in our time. Jesus Christ has come to inaugurate that new day. And we can now enter it by faith in Christ. Have a look at the present tense in, this, uh, in, this, in, this, in these verses here. Chapter 4 and verse 3. Now we who have believed, it's past tense, enter, present tense, that rest. Just as God has said. Those in the past who, who refused to believe, they shall never enter my rest. That's future. But now we who have believed enter that rest. Verse 10. There remains then a Sabbath rest of the people of God for anyone who enters God's rest. It's not will enter, is it? It enters, it's present tense. That's why it is today that we can enter it. It's not future anymore. Although always in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament particularly, you have this tension between what is called the now and the not yet. In other words, Christ has come and he will come. He's going to come again, isn't he? The Sabbath day has come in Christ and one day it will come in its fullness when Christ Returns, But he has come as the morning star and he has opened up. It's like the dawn has, has, has come. Think of those ladies on that first day, on that Easter day, when they went to the tomb. It was darkness, wasn't it? We're told they got up, but it was still dark and went to the tomb. And then the sun rose on the first day of the week. It's a lovely picture, isn't it, of that new day that has dawned. And I want you to see also the urgency that this writer attaches to this Sabbath day. It's nothing less than a token of salvation. The Sabbath day is nothing less than a token of salvation. This is God's ultimate purpose for us, and it's urgent that we enter into that day. The real Sabbath day, the real Sabbath rest, which is now, it is today. Look at verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you, none of you, has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another, and today, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin and deceitfulness. So, I mentioned this last week, didn't I, about gathering together. The importance of us gathering together, that we're not hardened by sin and deceitfulness. But that's what we're in. We're in today, and today is a day when we can be uh, hardened if we're not careful by sin and deceitfulness. So, we need to make sure that we don't have a sinful, unbelieving heart that resists what God has to say to us, chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. You see that, you sense the, the danger in his mind. He's thinking, look, I don't want any of you to be lost, but you need to make sure you don't fall short of it, because actually some of you may. Some of you perhaps have not yet got a renewed heart, not entered into that Sabbath rest experience. Verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Could it be said of you that you left no stone unturned in your search for salvation, that nothing is more important for you than to make sure that you have a place in heaven, that you have that personal assurance of it now? That you sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness above everything else. Or actually, are there things that actually take priority over that in your life? Can you say honestly that Christ means everything to you and that you have found the Sabbath rest, you've entered into it? Or is it possible that actually something is still preventing you from doing that? This writer is urgent about it and saying, look, please don't leave anything to chance. Make sure that while today still exists, before the day when he comes again, the day of salvation, today, enter in to that rest. And he points out that those who disobeyed, chapter 3 and verse 16, who were they? 
Those outside there, yes, maybe they do. But his concern is with those inside. He says, who are they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those with Moses, all those Moses led out of Egypt? You see, the people he's talking to who are in danger here are, are not the unbelievers outside. They're those who, who actually come into the congregation of the saved and they need to make sure they are saved. Because the ones who are here were warned about are those actually who followed Moses, but actually in their hearts disobeyed. They were told uh, uh, that their bodies were scattered over the wilderness. Being in church won't save us. I read a week or two ago, no, that, uh, that um, uh, letter from that person who had been in church most of his life. Remember that, that guy? Now in his 70s? Mm -hmm. Who had no assurance of salvation. He's the sort of person that Hebrews is addressing. Don't leave any stone unturned until you have found what you are looking for. The treasure in the field, the pearl of great price. It is there. Don't fall short. Don't give up on it. Don't, uh, don't buy anything else. It's a cheaper version. Obey the gospel message. That's why we have this whole passage ends in, in verses 12 and 13. Uh, chapter, chapter 4. The word of God is living and active. When you read the Bible, when you hear it preached, when it's handled correctly, the Word of God is living and active, and it can penetrate. It can do for you what it's done for many people here, and that is to expose our sin. It can penetrate even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It can judge the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from it. It's the Word of God, the message of salvation, which will open for you uh, that, uh, that new day. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom one day we must give account. Let the word of God, the message of the gospel, do its work and allow your heart to be softened, to be submissive and not hardened as it hears the words of the scriptures preached and taught. As you read them yourselves perhaps. We're going to be doing 1 Corinthians as you know from next week and Paul speaks to the Corinthians in, in much the same way in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. He says, you know, uh, all those people who followed Moses, they were baptised in, in the water and the cloud. He said that it was their bodies that were scattered in the wilderness. And he says to the people he's writing to in Corinth, don't be like them. They were examples to you. Don't follow them. Be obedient because he's afraid in Corinth as in any Christian church, there are people who in their hearts are still disobedient to the message who are still shown by their lives, they are not uh, submitted to, to God's rule in their hearts. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says this to the Corinthian church, don't receive God's grace in vain. For in the time of my favour, I heard you, again, time of my favour, the year of Jubilee, I suspect that's what you're referring to, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, he says, now, now is the day of now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. And he's speaking to Christians. I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the, the seventh day in Genesis was blessed. It was blessed because it was for our benefit, for our blessing. But it's also a day to be kept holy. We look at that this evening again if you want to come along this evening to the church on the green. But when the New Testament speaks about Christians looking forward to the day of the Lord, to his coming, what do they say? They say... This is Peter speaking. As you look forward to that day, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. So we are blessed by entering that day, but it also for us should be an encouragement to live holy lives. And we saw there, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. When we realise that day is going to come in its fullness, and the word of God is going to expose everything in our hearts, do you realise the need for holiness in your heart? If everything in it is exposed, that's why the Sabbath is a holy day. Because when we come into that day, we realise the need to be holy in God's sight. When he comes and he could come at any time, we're told, you must be ready for him. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. John says in his uh, first epistle, everyone who has this hope in Christ purifies himself. Because that hope in Christ is what actually leads you to be purified. To say, I cannot keep this sin in my life, I must get rid of it. This thought, this attitude of the heart, it must go. Because one day it will be exposed by Christ on that day of all days. And I want to be ready for him. So, 
And we have the remains of the Sabbath rest of the people of God. And there it is. So it's <coughs> 1 John 3. All of this hope in him, in Christ, purify themselves just as he is pure. So what about Sunday? What is so special about Sunday? Now my answer, uh, and it, again, it may be different from others here, but my answer is this. Nothing in particular. I don't believe that Sunday is any more holy than any other day of the week. And I can say more about that this evening if you want to come along. But the phrase, the first day of the week, <coughs> does appear several times in the New Testament. And it does seem to have become the day for gathering. It does have some significance. I don't think it's more important, but I think it has significance, if I can make that distinction. I'll explain why. In Matthew 28, first verse of that chapter says this, After the Sabbath... It's almost like the Sabbath is now past. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And of course, what they saw was an empty tomb. Resurrection had happened. As the sun rose on that first day of the week, it dawned on them also that Christ had risen. The new day had begun. All the four Gospels, every one of them, speaks about the first day of the week in relation to this day when Jesus rose. Perhaps pointing out this was the first day, not only of a, a physical week, but it's the first day of a new dawn, of a new age. A new era has begun with the resurrection. Seven weeks to the day after the resurrection came the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down. Fifty days after Easter. And the church was born in the sense of the Holy Spirit was now living in believers. And actually they knew God. They knew the experience of having the Holy Spirit living in their lives. That they had been redeemed. They had that surety, that guarantee, that seal of the Spirit. And then we read this in Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, says Luke, we came together to break bread. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. Paul writes, on the first day of every week, set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that was the day they met. Quite likely it was. But he's saying, actually, in order to make sure you are giving regularly, make it on the first day of the week uh, when you put aside a sum of money. So the first day of the week was obviously a day for Christians to meet. A day to remember the, uh, the resurrection. Uh, the first day of the new age. And anticipate, of course, his coming again. That's what we do we? on Sundays here. We remember the resurrection uh, and, the, uh, and his return. The new day in its fullness is coming. But there's not a single instruction in the New Testament to observe that day. We're told in Acts that they did meet on the first day. But the epistles don't say you must meet on the first day of the week. No instructions for rules governing Sabbath either to be transferred to Sunday. So though it's a good day to meet, and if we can, of course some people have shifts and uh, have, have work that requires them to work on a, on a, on a Sunday, uh, but it's a, it's a good day to meet. But there's no rule that says we have to meet on a Sunday. My daughter over in Canada, uh, their church meets on a Saturday evening because they have no building of their own and the building they actually rent and, and use is used on a Sunday by another church. So they meet on a Saturday evening, and uh, I don't think they're disobeying in any way at all uh, to do that. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, Paul actually warns Christians, uh, tells them to be wary of Sabbath observance, of falling back into rule-keeping. Okay, look at that scene if you want to look at the examples uh, of that. And the first day of the week is never called Sunday. Sunday, actually, a bit like Easter, Easter comes from a pagan word, Eostre, uh, I think from the uh, Anglo-Saxons, we call it Easter, but actually the word is a pagan word. Sunday, likewise, is a, is a pagan word. It honours the day of the sun. In the year 321 AD, the first Roman emperor to acknowledge Christianity, Constantine, enacted a law requiring public rest on what he called the most honourable day of the sun. Constantine was very smart. He wanted to bring together both the pagans and the Christians in his empire, and he thought making Sunday the honourable day of the sun is a way of both keeping them happy and also the pagans. And it worked for him. So that's why initially we had Sunday as a rest day, because a Roman emperor saw it as a clever political move. In 1234, the Pope 
Uh, about almost a thousand years later, the Pope also decreed that Sunday should be a day of rest uh, for compulsory worship uh, throughout Christendom. And that remains the case, of course, until recent decades. And by all means, let's take advantage of that while it uh, remains. But remember that the true Sabbath is not meeting on a Sunday. The true Sabbath is today, the day of salvation that Jesus Christ has brought about. Make every effort to enter that day. That's what the commandment really means. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. It is today. Jesus Christ has inaugurated it. Make sure, make every effort. Don't let any of you be hardened by sins and deceitfulness that you do not enter that rest. It is available to, to you all this morning.